And so on Friday, Blizzard did their Reddit AMA, Ask Me Anything on anything to do with uh, Battle for Azeroth, any of the issues around that. Ian Hazacosta's game director, Josh Allen, the community manager there. And yesterday, I did my video on some of the responses that I think I was very critical of. Uh, there was a great response to that, so thanks for that. Today, what I said I would do is go through some of the comments that were a bit more positive. There were some replies that gained general approval, so what I want to do is go through those and add my thoughts to those as well. So the first one, just to throw this out, a nice easy one, uh, I don't think this is actually from the AMA as such, but it was related to it, where something was said and then a community manager just wanted to be super explicit, saying just to confirm explicitly, yes, we're increasing the drop rates of pets, mounts, toys, transmog items and quest starters. So there's some people showing some consternation about that. I think in particular, some of the items you can get from the Island Expedition, which on the face of it are gear, but... In reality, a lot of people like the transmogs on them. They like the look of them, even though the gear itself for the people doing those uh, is not going to be fantastic. But they like the look of them and, and they're BOEs. So a lot of these, even greens, are selling for quite a lot in the auction house. So I think people will be pleased that uh, those sort of items will increase in drop rate. And I think this is the sort of thing where you don't want to be too mean about it. When it comes to power upgrades, it's actually quite weird. Because I, I think, and I think there has been a little bit of feeling, I'm not going to say overwhelming feeling, it's certainly my feeling, I know there's some other people as well, that it's very easy to get power upgrades as a player. I mean, I'm already at an item level equal to the gear you get from normal old deer. I haven't done normal old deer, <laughs> it's not in live. I did a few bosses, that's it, I haven't even cleared it. Um, and yet that's where my item level is. It's been, and, and as a casual, and I mean proper casual as well, and it's been so easy to, to get the power of my character up. But when it comes to things like this that don't increase the, the power of your character, you know, you, you need to give those out a bit more freely, I think. Uh, if, if, if Blizzard really wants to encourage us, as opposed to compel us to play more often, to play every day, then uh, that's much the best way to do it. Rather than compelling us by offering power upgrades, encourage us by offering more cosmetic upgrades. So I think that's great. But anyway, on to a much more serious one. So this is from Ian Hazacosta's big old post, this one. Uh, so I have to go through this in bits. Uh, this one did uh, achieve uh, general approval. Uh, it was to do with Azerite gear. There's been a lot of issues around Azerite gear. So i uh, start off by saying, we're certainly not entirely happy with how the system is playing out. And all of these are very, very valid concerns. We agree that it's a problem for someone to look at a 30 item level upgrade under normal circumstances and feel like it's not worth equipping. I know this sounds like uh, this risk sounding like a cop out, but a few of the problems you've outlined simply boil down to tuning. But again, you know, I had to say before, you know, the problem is tuning, fine tuning when it goes live is okay, massive tuning less so. But here is is where I think um, Communication on this area earlier on would have been better, but at least they've done it now. So it says, once you get to heart level 18, a process that will become increasingly fast as the weekly catch-up systems continue to ramp up, effectively letting you gain AP 30% faster with each passing week. I will, you know, add something to that in a moment. You can activate the outer ring of any item in the game, and that's where the most powerful traits lie. And I think that's quite important to bear in mind when you sort of think about the rings. The outer ring, when people are talking about BIS as the right traits and so on, they tend to be talking about the ones on the outer ring. After that, you have a sort of utility one. And, and don't get me wrong, I, I absolutely want the speedy one. Anything to do with speediness. Um, but, you know, th there's that one. And, and then you've got another one in the raid and Mythic Plus dungeon stuff, which gives you something related to your role. Like for me as a paladin, there's going to be one healing, one DPS and one tanky one, so I'm always going to just pick the, the DPS one there. But for some who have multiple DPS specs, there might be an actual choice there as well. And then you've got your item level, the one that just boosts item level at the end. Now, it's worth noting, of course, that plus five item levels is a power upgrade in itself. Uh, so being able to unlock that last one is also quite important. But he's absolutely correct that the key bit, the thing that counts for several percent of your DPS... You know, those traits can add 3 or 4% to your DPS value, being able to unlock that. 
and and as he says there it's intended it's intended part of the design to be able to unlock that very early on so there shouldn't really be an issue with that even i lazy as i am have got uh, neck level 19 so i can easily uh, unlock all of those as he says if i equip any piece of azerite gear now i can unlock the outer trait um so that's an important point it is a, you know i think they probably should have mentioned that earlier but they've mentioned it now and i think sort of thumbs up to that one um that will maybe you know smooth out a few feathers there um it says there's a ton of primary stat on azerite pieces in part to bolster the importance of item level there and the power trait the power of traits is directly proportional to the item of the item that contains them so a 370 heroic Uldir helm will have a 30% more powerful trait than a 340 Raid Finder Uldir version of the same item. So that's useful as well to get that information out there. That was something that was very difficult to get out of them during the beta process, I remember. Coming back before we move on to the thing there about effectively letting you gain AP 30% faster with the catch-up mechanic, someone did put a comment on my videos, which is certainly well worth remembering. And that an awful lot of people, not everyone, but an awful lot of people in the first few weeks are doing loads of content. So they're doing lots of stuff that gives them the artifact power. After that, it slows down a little bit. You're not doing quite so many world quests. You're maybe not doing quite so many dungeons. You're not doing quite so many of the things that reward you with artifact power. So although you're, in theory, able to get your artifact power, whatever, 30% faster each week, in practice because you're not actually doing as much stuff that rewards artifact power, it's it doesn't actually get fast, if you see what I mean. It sort of levels out a little bit. Um, but nonetheless, the, the point that he was trying to make is that with the catch-up there, there is a catch-up in there to help out those who don't want to ram all the content. Anyway, moving on to what he was saying after that, it says, where all this breaks down is when both of the traits on your 370 piece are significantly worse than the ones on your 340 piece, because this is where it is for a lot of people. I mean, there's two aspects to Azerite gear. One is that, let's say you've got, this is an extreme example, but it happens, a 370 piece and a 340 piece. But the 340 piece has got this trait, 370 piece has got a pretty crap one. The 340 gear could be better, even taking into account it's got much less of that primary stat on it, because that trait is just straight up way better even given that it's a 340 version of it. Um, and that has happened, or where it's sort of more on par. And then the other aspect to it is because although that outer ring being unlocked is the key one, there is the item level to consider, the plus five item levels. And there's also, as I say, on the better Azerite gear, uh, the extra ring, which can also add to your DPS if you're a DPS or other aspects if you're a healer or a tank. Um, and you may not be able to unlock those on the higher item level piece as well because of your neck level. But you may be able to unlock all of them on the lower item level piece. So there are issues certainly with Azerite gear. It's Although Blizzard have done a lot of work, and it's worth remembering this as well. At the start of Legion, I remember being uh, when the Mythic Plus dungeons first opened up, we did a Mythic Plus Eye of Ashara. I got a high item level ring. Uh, it was crit mastery, I believe. It was certainly something mastery because it was way higher item level than, than what I had. We'd only just really started doing Mythic Plus Dungeons and I couldn't... It wasn't an upgrade for me. It wouldn't be an upgrade to equip it. We had a warrior in the party. They'd have absolutely loved it. Loved it. Um, couldn't give it to them because it, I didn't. it was the highest item level piece I had in the ring slot. So remember a time when secondary stats were so important just on normal gear obviously rings it was it was much more the case and necks as well at the time it's actually moved on now if you run your own stat weights in raid bots or simcraft say you can see that the primary stat is now i think i can't speak for absolutely all classes and specs but i believe by and large if not exclusively that the primary stat is much more important and blizzard did a lot of work on that um which you know sometimes people have forgotten or not aware of because of so many other issues that seem to be a bit more pressing. But that is an important issue because ultimately, if you're going to use item level as any sort of judge at all, the only way it even becomes a rough guide for what is and is not an upgrade is if the primary stat is much more powerful than the secondary stats. 
because the secondary stats are very variable on pieces of gear, but the primary stat isn't. You know, you, you, the primary stat on a, a 370 piece for a given slot is going to be the same for all of the pieces you can have in that slot at that item level. But it's the secondary stats that vary in terms of what those secondary stats are. Not so much the budget, but what they are. So it's worth remembering that as well. But yeah, we have an issue here with Azerite gear, which has a whole different dimension because of those Azerite traits. Um, because of those traits there. and Because we used to have the thing with tier armor where people would be discussing like with some classes they'd be disappointed with their set bonuses and saying well actually it's only worth having the two set bonus and then i might as well just wear whatever i'm my best stats in terms of non-tier gear it wasn't worth having the four set for some classes the four set was a must have and you absolutely wanted to get it even if it meant you you just get the first four pieces you could get even if it meant an item level downgrade because you were a mythic raider but using the heroic pieces even though you had mythic off tier pieces as well or it meant using the bits with the the poorer specs on it and with some classes you would even want the four set bonus plus the two set bonus from the previous tier even though the item level for that could be significantly lower after a few weeks it was still worth it for some significant amount of time at least um but at in those sort of situations, you you didn't have competition between different pieces of tier gear as such because you had different tier bonuses from tier to tier, but the item level gap did get to a point where you would want the new tier eventually. Um, not the case with Azerite gear because you can have two pieces of Azerite gear at the same item level and one trait is way better than the other. It's almost like you're almost choosing your set bonus, um, but except some of them are much stronger than others. So he said here, uh, it says we have made hundreds of unique traits for BFA and 216 spec specific traits for the outer ring alone. He's saying that, I think, to get across the idea that this is hugely complex and very difficult to deal with. At the same time, I think some people might say to that, your choice to do that. Um, many of those are undertuned. A handful are overly powerful to the point that they stomp out the entire decision space for a spec and the game becomes about getting a piece with one specific trait. We'll be fixing the outliers on both ends, probably buffing dozens of weaker traits. They've already done a lot of this. Um, they have already been buffing and nerfing these traits. Um, but anyway, it says they'll probably be buffing dozens of weaker traits and nerfing a handful of two strong ones. So just remember what I always say in every situation. If ever you have a piece of gear, the item level look wise looks like it's competitive what you've got but you look at it it seems way lower never throw it away don't scrap it don't disenchant it don't vend it always keep it people take the mickey out of the mess in my bags because it's full of junk as people see it no it's not i'm keeping it because tuning could suddenly change some junk into treasure that's why i keep a load of crap in my bags i clear it out every now and then not very often so never throw away anything that's decent item level just because it sims poorly now. It may not next week. Anyway, on to the next bit. It says, while the generic traits are deliberately fairly straightforward, some of the spec-specific ones are indeed too passive or interact awkwardly with spec rotations. I mean, this is where I, I cut them a little bit of slack here because people certainly have complained about them being boring. If they're passive, they're seen as boring. But what he says here about interacting awkwardly with spec rotations is equally valid. I mean, at the end of the day, a trait, it's either going to be passive and therefore seen as boring, or it's going to be interactive with your class, in which case it could interact awkwardly. And this is the problem. Where's the fine line between something that enhances your rotation, like a tier set bonus used to do? Uh, but the fact is there's so many of them that it, it's that again they've set themselves an impossible task but the, the task has been set there's no point in criticizing that now they've set themselves that task and it is a difficult balance and, and for that reason i think most of them have to be fairly passive because you can't just have all of them or even a significant number of them interacting with your rotation because it's going to be very jarring um and also it's going to have to make you almost relearn your class every time you get a new piece of gear if it's an upgrade uh, so, you know, it's a difficult one. It says, we'll be retiring some of those in an upcoming patch and adding better replacements to the pool. I think that's an advantage we've got with Azerite as well, the Azerite traits. Um, 
you know, it'll be understood right from the start that there were always going to be some traits that aren't carried on to the next tier and then other ones add and so on. And it allows them the option of, of judging like which ones just haven't worked. Not not so much planning it well in advance, but actually decide when the decision has to be made. Going, look, and that can be made quite late on, uh, to close to release, and just saying, look, which traits haven't worked, which ones are people not happy about? Let's just drop those. Keep the ones that people are happy about and then add in you know, the new ones to replace the ones we removed. And they can keep sort of doing that as the expansion rolls on. So that is a, that's a benefit of the way that this has been done. And uh, it says, again, tuning is a big part of the current problem. If you look at a guide, and most of the recommended traits you'll spec are various flavors of proc damage on your target or proc a buff on yourself, then yeah, that's really underwhelming. But of course, proc damage on target, in particular, proc a buff on yourself, they're, they're always going to be very powerful traits in many ways because particularly if procking a buff on yourself can interact with other buffs that you give yourself uh, and, and doing lots of damage, particularly burst damage is all about lining up those buffs on yourself. Um, but anyway, so it says no argument there, but there are dozens of traits out there with deep interactions on par with Legion legendaries, old set bonus or gold border artifact traits such as interactions between abilities or resource generation in ways that vary rotations, talent selection, stat priority, and so forth. The problem is that they're mostly just too weak to feel worth using just now, but we can fix that. And that's a fair enough comment. Again, we can be critical of the fact that this there should have been, as I say, a much closer amount of tuning before it went live. But it is also true to say that some of the ones that people are not using at the moment that might in general terms be considered more fun, they're just too weak, can be fixed with tuning. They can all be fixed with tuning. It's just, if it was a straightforward process, it would have been done by now. And again, we can always say that it still should have been done by now because you shouldn't be releasing stuff when it's not ready because Blizzard used to have the attitude. You know, someone asked them, when is it coming out then? When it's bloody well ready. Whereas now, when's it coming out? Oh yeah, we're gonna give you loads of notice. Because that was a funny thing. You know, the last two expansions have been notable for the fact that we were told the actual release date, not the when it's definitely going to be out by, but the release date, definitive, four months before it released. Previous expansions, they only gave us two months notice. So it's like in previous expansions, they, you know, only announced it when they, when they were definitely ready, basically. Whereas now, giving you four months, that's twice as much as we used to get. That sort of suggests... They're giving themselves a much smaller margin for error. Which means inevitably some things are not ready. In Legion, we had um, changes to classes even during the expansion, which is much rarer before that. And we're getting it again now. Anyway, it says, in terms of long-term prospects, we see the current system as a foundation upon which to continue building, not a treadmill to throw out there and let's sit passively for the rest of the expansion. We'll be adding loads of new traits in future content updates for starters, but tuning work is something that is already ongoing and which will ramp up in the very near future as we now have most of the data we need to make those adjustments. So the take home from that is come Tuesday, this is going to be particularly hard if you're playing on the North American realm, sorry about this, but come Tuesday, expect massive changes, not necessarily just to Azerite traits as well. So... Yeah, check up on the guides, check up on Sims. Um, if you use SimCraft on your own computer, make sure you download the new version. Get yourself on Raidbots, re-sim things, because actually I say that. Um, depends when it's all announced. Because this is why I say it's hard on the N NA ones, because things may not be updated to take account of any hot fixes that appear suddenly on Tuesday. Whereas we get a day extra in the EU. So, unfortunate, sorry. Uh, we'll get a bit more time to be able to resim these before our first raid, or for those who do raid. Um, but it's not all bad North America. At the moment, you've got a guild in the world first position. So, you know, rough with the smooth. Right, on to the next uh, sort of comment. Also by In Has a Cost. As you know, I sort of noticed, I don't want to be sort of too bitchy about this, but the comments that received strong approval were the ones from Ian. Not saying all of his met with approval, I have to say, but the ones that met with approval tended to be from Ian Hazacostas as opposed to a certain other gentleman. 
Never mind. Um, so next little thing, it says, uh, yes, we're applying a hot fix that makes the various cosmetic bonus rewards more common, but this is more to do with the island really. So it says, island expeditions represent a stab at an entirely new type of content, and we're certainly planning continued improvements and refinement to the system over the rest of the expansion, as well as new locales with varied mechanics to explore. So in other words, it's something that is going to be developed over the expansion. This was something that was not clear earlier on in Alpha, where they were basically saying they really don't know what they're doing with islands. Um, whereas now they really say, no, we are going to develop this over the expansion. So that's positive. That is good, because that was not always going to be the case. It should have seemed obvious because it's a very new feature. Why would you bring in a new feature and then just drop it? You could argue they did that in Legion with the um, with an army training scenario, which was fantastic, but a bit of a novelty that wasn't really... They didn't use the same sort of thing. Well, they didn't carry it on, really, did they? But for this one, they are. It says, in particular, so some specifics, we want to add more new events to increase the variety of the experiences players have when jumping into expeditions or running the same pool of islands repeatedly, which is obviously really important. I, I think right from the start with islands, they tried to make clear... Obviously, this is the sort of content that could get very old very quickly. So they wanted to make it a different experience every time you go in. Um, that's always important with what you might call procedurally generated content. I mean, the way they did it with Mythic Plus Dungeons, for example, is the affixes, uh, different affixes, which change the nature of the dungeon um, very effectively. So with islands, um, you know, be able to chop and change them and have different mechanics, different NPCs and so on to make it a different experience is very important as well. Uh, it says, we've all probably that giant clump of Azerite, stalagmites and elementals pop up here a zillion times. And whilst it's always lucrative, it doesn't exactly help build a sense that you never know what's going to be around the next corner when you see it four times in a row. We're also looking at how we spawn islands from a layout perspective to add a bit more variety from visit to visit. So that would be quite encouraging. You know, if... if I do get the impression that with islands, that it's very technology driven. In other words, someone came up with some this you know this pitch that you know we've got the technology, we could do this thing, we could do something exciting. Can you think of anything we could do with this technology that we can get into the game that could be really useful? And they came up with the islands thing. You know, for the next expansion, it could be something else, but also refined, it could be much better. So. It does sound like it is because it's technology driven that it's it is going to be refined. And as they refine the technology, that should allow them to improve the experience in terms of the gameplay side of it for us. Um, so as we've heard feedback that the pace of expeditions in general feels too frenetic and the go, go, go race to gather Azerite detracts from any ability to really explore your environment. I mean, this is perfectly true or fully process the events that are unfolding. Ultimately, the Horde versus Aligned theme of expeditions in particular requires that competitive feel, which we know isn't for everyone, but we'd love to explore applying the underlying tech upon which expeditions were built to other settings that don't have that same pacing. And again, this is sort of reinforcing that view I, I, I was explaining there, that the islands was what they used to implement this tech, but the tech could be used for lots of other things as well, which I guess from this point of view would suggest some solo type content which wouldn't necessarily just be solo versions of the islands i'm not talking about that but something else that they could use as an outlet for this technology and if it's the sort of thing where they're talking about you know built to other settings that don't have the same pacing suggests to me more solo content um we've had things in the past where you know you've you've been accompanied by npcs who can adopt various roles to help you out uh, and this just sounds like it might be the sort of tech that could be used to make an improved version of that. So you could have you could have strong narrative scenarios like we did in MOP, which I quite liked, um, but better. Anyway, it says, in short, future BFA updates will include not just more content within the existing structure, but refinements to that structure. We've been following all the feedback closely, but in general have just been 100% focused on working on the game and haven't had a chance to come up for air and discuss our thoughts with the community. No. Um, this, is, this is a positive video. I'm not saying anything about that. Uh, that's sort of a recurring theme lately, I realise. But, you know, the idea... 
that something like I, as they are now islands and war fronts as well when it comes to that have been content that has received a, it's more than its fair share of criticism but if we look at it and this is the way i do look at it if we look at it as the first tentative steps of new technology it is interesting i think it is positive to look at what might come from it because you know, it is, I, I really don't get the impression that someone came up with the idea of war fronts and someone came up with the idea of islands and it was like, how do we do this um, technically? I think it was the other way around. I think it was like, here's a thing that would be great for the game. You think of a way to use it. Uh, and, and that means that there'll be other things used to help drive that technology on as well, uh, which could end up being really good. Uh, the way I look at it is this, although this may not be the best analogy, is if you think about garrisons in Wad, where did that come from? In Mop, the previous expansion, we had the farm. The farm was a little, effectively the garrison was like the farm. You went onto your little farm, which is just like eight patches of soil really. Um, but when you went into it, even though you're in a little location with lots of other players, you went into your farm, you were effectively phased. Other people could be on their farm as well and the same plot of land, but they wouldn't be visible on your bit of farm. And the garrison was effectively that technology thrown wide open. And this could be the same sort of thing. It's the first few tentative steps to something much grander, potentially. Although, hopefully, something better than garrisons. <laughs> um, anyway, on to the sort of final little comment I want to talk about today here. So, it says here we did a... This had a, actually... This is the opposite round. In yesterday's video, most of the comments I was talking about did get very strong disapproval in terms of the upvotes and downvotes. Uh, whereas... One of them actually got a net total of upvotes, whereas I didn't think it was a terribly positive one. This one, as you can see here, minus 85, as I've taken it. Um, so a relatively strong disapproval, but I actually think there's, there's positive things out of this. So he said, we did a pretty poor job of communicating in advance exactly how the war front rotation was going to work, since it was very different on beta for ease of testing purposes. That is a thing that needs to be borne in mind for each, and I sort of said this at the time. When they give us content to test in the beta, it's not implemented in exactly the same way it will be implemented when it goes live. Because, yes, they need us to test it. They know that there's not going to be that many people going to do a load of grinding to be able to access the content. So they need to just basically give it to you on a plate sometimes so you can get enough people testing it. Uh, and you can easily fall foul of it, you know, even le very late on in beta, the way it is, is not necessarily the way it would be implemented exactly in live, because, you know, it's there for testing purposes. Just like, you know, to take an extreme example, the vendors in the beta uh, that you can just buy raid gear from, you know, all the raid gear, you can just buy it for your character. Uh, someone might go in there if they were uninitiated in these things and say, oh, you can just buy the raid gear from vendors. Why on earth would we go to the raids for it? It's just there for the beta, of course, to help you test. But as he says there, they should have communicated it better. Where there are those differences, where they put those things in, you know, it was obvious that people were going to be planning, particularly at the start of an expansion, they want to sort of know, right, what are my objectives in the first week? Even casual players do this. I did it. You know, you don't have to be a serious raid. Obviously, they have to, it's like military planning. Uh, but for everyone else, you still want to plan. So what are my objectives in the first week? What are my objectives in the second and the third and so on? Start of an expansion is very much like that because, you know, the content comes out week by week. Um, and and the fact that there was, we got the completely wrong end of the, the stick on this one didn't help. So anyway, it says the gap between player expectation and reality didn't do us any favours here. On a factual note, the whole cycle is likely to be more like three and a half weeks and not five. There are basically three stages you progress through as an attacker. One, donating to the war, uh, to, to fund the war effort, turning in materials for AP, turn, tune to take four to six days depending on player contributions. This is the time, by the way, that if you're into your professions that you... Um, make the stuff that's going to be used to hand it in, stick it on the auction house, and then when you're not in that cycle anymore, you're obviously going to get less gold for it, then don't do it so much. Just build up your stock. So, you know, I suppose if black, for me as a blacksmith, you know, the stirrups, build up your stock, and then when the next cycle comes around, put them on the auction house then. Just saying. Um, Warfront actives, the next step, able to queue with a once, which is sort of just coming to the end of it now for Horde, 
uh, with a once per cycle 370 reward and then repeatable 340s with obviously the possibility of Warforge or Titanforge um, for seven days. And then the third bit is zone control. Can kill world boss for a shot at a 370 reward, 340s from the rare spawns, 11 to 13 days, while the opposite faction does steps one and two on their end. Uh, so we now at least know. So we know how it's going to work. Um, there are two reasons Warfronts are paced this way. First, it lets us give them generous rewards relative to other core content like dungeons without completely obsoleting that content. Second, we want to make sure that most players feel like they have a decent chance to participate in each step. If the Warfront were only available for three days instead of seven, the whole thing would move faster. Yes, but someone who wasn't able to log in for a few days would miss the activity entirely. And I think that is fair enough and I think it's a good point. And then the last thing, which again, you know, I would have thought would be a really positive thing here. They've said, we also do intend to add additional Warfronts over time so that these cycles will be interwoven in a way that hopefully makes it feel like there's more to do more often. So, I, you know, as, as the expansion goes on, there might be potentially different phases of different Warfronts at any one time. Um, I don't know whether he necessarily means that at any one time there'll always be a Warfront over, open. It may not mean that at all. Um, but the fact is if they're adding more Warfronts, and it's like when a new Warfront comes in, it doesn't get rid of the old Warfront, then that means there could be a rolling program of them. Uh, and then that might satisfy those people as well. I mean, I do also concern myself with those who... I'd be interested to know what people really think of Warfronts in that it's the reason why people are upset about the implementation of Warfronts because they just see it as a loot piñata and it's the loot they really want or do they actually enjoy the content for itself? Because I have to say I don't find it very engaging at all. Uh, I did it for the loot. I did it once to get the 370 piece and I did it another time because I was streaming anyway. I thought, what the hell? Maybe I'll get a Titan Forge on stream. And I didn't, so I didn't do it again. Um, I wouldn't have done it at all were it not for the 370 piece. And I wouldn't have done it the second time were it not for the fact that I was feeling a bit lucky. A feeling, I have to say, that uh, was not correct at all. But uh, but I would be interested to know, do, do, are there people or there's a massive number of people that actually enjoy it and are just sad that it's not available yet if you're Alliance, for example? Or is it just that, well, I could have done with the 370 piece now? Because that's another thing uh, where, again, it's too late to do anything about it because this is the way it was designed. But I can well understand it from Alliance players' point of view, even though, um, as I said before, you know, Alliance players are basically just a figment of Blizzard's imagination now. It doesn't actually exist as a faction, unfortunately. But you can imagine it, you know, so so we've got this 370 piece when it's actually really strong. By the time Alliance unlock it, it's not that a 370 piece will be crap. But for some players, it will it will not be as big a bonus as it has been for the people who first got access to the Warfronts. There is that side of it as well. I think it is something that probably Blizzard should have thought about. But the way I also judge it is you can criticise, um, you know, things that have, have emerged from decisions that were made months ago the cows come home and, and it's probably right that we should do that at least once but once you get to a position where it's like okay well we're here now this is the situation as we have it it's like where do we move from here I'd, and that's what I find more positive about comments the comments that I wanted to see from the AMA which there were some but there weren't enough was where do we go from here there's no point in beating them with a stick over what they've decided to do it's like right we're in this situation now what do we do to rapidly turn it around and, and with some of the comments, you get the impression that they'll be on the right tracks. And although it's disappointing and even unacceptable for some people that we should have to have a period where we have to wait, that at least we know where we're going with it. And I think that's what some of the comments that I've gone through today sort of illustrate there. So with islands, it, it, we've got a bit, we've got a better picture now of where islands are going to go. We've got a little bit of a better picture about where war fronts are going to go. We've also got a better picture of where Azerite traits were going. He's, he's all but basically told us, watch out for next reset because there's going to be big changes with Azerite traits. So if you've got a load of pieces of gear, if you've scrapped an Azerite piece that was a good item level just because it had crap traits on it, then that was a bit silly. <laughs> um, but we'll have to wait and see for Tuesday or, or Wednesday or whenever we can catch up with the Sims. Um, but hopefully, if it's just straight up nerfs and buffs, 
it sh they should be able to update those in SimCraft quite quickly. So we, I'm pretty sure we'll be fine for Wednesday for the EU opening. So I'll leave you with that. A um, little bit of a more positive one. So we'll probably keep cycling around. There's so many more things I want to discuss that came as a result of this as well, which is neither criticism nor, you know, support, uh, but just some general talking points, which I want to get over over the next week or so when I get time. But I'm back at work again tomorrow. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed the video as it is anyway. If you did, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe and share for further content. And until next time, I'll see you later.